like getting involved in this political stuff. Well, not like the whole election depends on me. There's always enough people to vote. What can one person do? You ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. This country depends on us for more than just excuses. September 8, 1900, a hurricane hits Galveston, Texas, leaving massive damage and 6,000 dead. But there's a lot of excitement and uh, wonder, I guess, of what's going to happen next. Where are you going to hit the nasty turbulence? Hurricane Camille strikes Mississippi and Louisiana, leaving 256 dead in its wake. It's usually pretty turbulent in a forming or falling apart storm and very calm in the middle of one, but you never know till you get in there what you're going to have. Houston, Texas is the target for Hurricane Alicia. This time, the death toll is only 17. Where most pilots try to avoid uh, severe weather, uh, our pilots and our air crews go looking for the, the worst weather known to uh, mankind. Hurricanes have always taken a heavy toll in property damage. But the past two decades have seen a sharp decrease in the loss of life. The reason? More advanced notice. And the key is the Air Force's weather reconnaissance mission. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Dennis Wood, commander of the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, or as we're better known, the Hurricane Hunters. We are one of only two such units in the active duty Air Force and one in the Air Force Reserves. Our primary mission is to fly into the eye of hurricanes in order to gather weather data for the National Hurricane Center, which they use in the forecasting of movement, strength, and of development of tropical storms. The weather officers and drop zone systems operators are as part of their weather service, while the remainder of the personnel are assigned to the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron. When we fly, however, we fly as one organization that's truly a team effort, and each is dependent on the other for the successful accomplishment of the overall mission. This is different from the average weather assignment for an officer in that we're actually flying. We can fly into the weather environment to look at it, to study it, whereas in a normal assignment, you usually stay on the ground to do that. A lot of times we'll go out and fly the same uh, hurricane three, four, five days in a row. Um, a lot of those times you end up flying about 12 hours. You come back and land and you have 12 hours crew rest and you're out again the same storm the next day. This is a really good option for female especially, for any navigator. In this particular mission, a navigator is really important because a computer can be used from point to point, but we don't fly point to point in a storm. We're trying to draw a line to the center of the storm, and it isn't always straight. Every storm is different. Nothing can be decided ahead of time. Once you go through the wall, that's the, uh, probably the busiest time for us. Not too much thought about the hurricane goes on. If it's real bumpy, you just try and uh, work the best you can. We release the sign into the atmosphere, and it free falls with a parachute, sends back pressure, temperature, and humidity. From that, we take the data, analyze it, and then send it back to the uh, hurricane center. Everything's done in a real safe manner. In over 100,000 flying hours, we've never had a major aircraft accident.
experience that I've had that I really think is worth mentioning is the first storm. Because it's beautiful to look at. It's just struck me that I was very fortunate to be able to see a hurricane from that direction. Not that many people have. I think that we're doing a valuable service for the, the people of the United States, but the mission we do will save some lives and help people prepare. It gives us a great satisfaction to be doing that type of humanitarian mission. William E. Eubank, Jr. I'm a Major General, retired. 53, I was sent to Castle to command the 93rd Bombardment Wing. And I knew then, have, having worked for the program at SAC headquarters, that we would get to B-52. It was a moment that we were all looking forward to, and it was a thrill to me uh, to fly the airplane. It was a real responsive airplane, although I've often said it in comparison to the B-47, it sort of drove like a truck, but I don't think any other airplane in the history of the Air Force has ever been able to do the thing that the B-52 has. The airplane I have now is, is just 100% better piece of equipment. Uh, better engine, better avionics. It has the capability of doing uh, a SAC mission just uh, two or three fold over what the original B-52 had. It's just one of those kind of airplanes that just keeps flying. For those of us that fly it, it almost takes on its own personality, and we have a lot of trust in it, a lot of faith in the weapon system. That's why we don't see it going off or anything really replacing it in the very near future. The primary thing that makes it so special is that it was designed for one mission in the last 30 years. That mission has evolved to encompass a variety, many faceted mission that it has now. Originally designed for high level only, now it's uh, primarily in the low level penetration role, it's in the sea surveillance role, it's in the conventional role. Almost anything that you ask of this airplane, the uh, powers that be have, uh, have tested for. It's done. It's done very well. In some cases, it's the only airplane that can do that. This is a very complex fighting machine. 30 years ago, when the first B-52 went operational, in the past 30 years, there's been quite a few facelifts. And each time, we've gotten a better airplane. There's no doubt that this bomber has met the national defense need for a long time and will continue to do so well into the future. Gentlemen, you take your seats. I'm Major Fleming, your senior aircraft commander. I'd like to welcome you all to your first tour of ALERT. The entire concept of strategic alert is based upon our ability to react and respond in a timely manner. You must remember during your first tour of ALERT that you must never do anything that will jeopardize your capability to respond to your aircraft. Gentlemen, the ability to react is what we are all about. Gentlemen, the ability to react is what we are all about. Here. We're on alert for a week at a time, and uh, they make large, large sacrifices being away from their uh, loved ones, their family. But they never give up. They seem to be able to always reach down, pull together, and get the, the mission done. And every time we do, it gets the oil and, and drilling pumping because we don't really know what's coming up or what the situation is. So it's a test of our abilities to keep us sharp, to keep us ready to go to war at a moment's notice because we probably won't have very much notice if we are called to, to defend our country.
the crew is a very, almost becomes an integral part of the airplane because it's almost like a piece of the machinery. A well-oiled crew is just like a well-oiled machine. Uh, the better you do, the better the airplane flies, the better you get your mission done. It is a, it is a tough airplane, and uh, it's a very forgiving airplane. It's just one of those kind of airplanes that just keeps flying. They're exceptional people that work with an exceptional aircraft. It can do anything. It's been around that long, and then, no matter what you ask of it, it'll do it. Seven years of, of histories of people that have uh, sat in those seats and you're a, a part of it today 